Yeah, I'm sorry. The way I walk is wrong. The way I dress is wrong. It's like, why am I here? Seriously. I have to do all this to conform to you. What the are you doing for me? We don't even have sex. I don't understand why I'm here. I really don't. If you don't understand why you're here, then you can pack your things and go back. I'm done here. Wow, what the heck did I just watch? One minute Kim and Usman were all smiles and it looked like their adoption of Mahadi might actually go ahead. And then literally the next minute, they're arguing and calling off their relationship. So is it really over for Kim and Usman? I am done. I think we'll never have peace, me and Kimbali. I've been through a lot of and I can't just sit here and just like let some dude just sit there and just like tear me down and that's how it feels to me. <laughs> okay, so this was a wild episode. <laughs> Let me try and make sense of it all. Let's start at the very beginning. Let's rewind back to the start of this episode. So we join them all at a venue you wouldn't normally associate with having a serious conversation about adoption. Today, Usman and I are at an amusement park with Jamal and Mahadi and his parents so we can start to bond and continue talking about this adoption. Little does she know that all of this talk of adoption will be a major factor in the breakdown of her relationship. But for now, Kim continues to ignore all of Jamal's advice and instead she wants to focus on how they can get this adoption to go ahead. Yesterday was kind of stressful mm -hmm. and I wanted to just come out and just have fun. Mm. Yeah, doesn't really look like Mahadi's mum is having fun, does it? All that's probably going on in her mind is that her family is about to be ripped apart. Now, the worrying thing here is that while Mahadi's mum is against the idea of adoption, Mahadi's dad, Mohammed, seems much more open to it. You'd hope that both parents would need to be on board before any adoption would take place. But for Mohammed, the benefits might just make it worthwhile. It can be beneficial because he's going to have an Western education there, good school there. That is quite concerning. The fact that Mohammed is focusing on what he believes to be the benefits of this arrangement seem to suggest this adoption might be creeping ever closer. However, he does make it clear that before they decide anything, he'd need to consult his mum. We'll go and meet our mother. We have to go there and discuss about the issue before we go to the conclusion. Given what we know about Usman and Mohammed's mum, however, I'd say the chances of her giving her approval are probably quite high. So that raises the next question. When would the adoption actually take place? Surely Kim and Usman have given this thought and discussed it between themselves, right? And it wouldn't happen today. It'll be a couple years, you know? And I what? just... What? Couple years? Well, at least a year. For the adoption? Yeah. It's not going to be fast. The earlier for us, the better. Here they are trying to convince everyone that their relationship is strong enough to adopt a child. Yet all of these communication issues make it seem like they don't even talk. And yes, I'm choosing my words carefully. I'll come back to that shortly. Now, having seen this, it's no surprise that when we join them the next day, as Jamal is packing to leave Nigeria, Jamal wants to raise his concerns with his mum. I've talked to my mom a few times about the adoption and it's obviously a red flag for me. Y'all make it seem like y'all have everything figured out. How are y'all gonna really be in the future? Once again, Jamal is right. He can see what's about to happen a million miles away. He urges his mum to just slow down, think things through. Don't get caught up in this whole whirlwind just because Usman wants you to, only to find out too late that your relationship isn't as strong as you thought it was. And now you've got a kid to look after. Kim listens to what is said, but it's unclear whether it's sinking in or not. And then Usman enters the room. I feel like I'm like 100% more skeptical than my mom is about my mom and Usman's relationship. They have a lot of issues that they need to discuss. 
I don't know if Jamal is praying or trying to hold back tears there. Either way, he's very concerned about what will happen when he leaves Nigeria, and rightly so. Someone else who also seems to be concerned, for altogether different reasons, is Usman. I get the impression he doesn't want to leave Jamal and Kim alone for too long. If he influenced Kimbali not to adopt, then it's a big problem. I think sometimes he's trying to be you know, like too involved into the relationship. It's a bizarre situation. Jamal doesn't trust Usman, and Usman sees Jamal as a threat. There's clearly tension between them. Yet Kim is perfectly happy to bury her head in the sand and act like they're all one big happy family. I think you guys got along well, like I feel. I feel like we're family right now. Right, babe? Yes. Notice how Jamal was absolutely silent there. I don't think he agrees. And when the time comes for Jamal to jump in a taxi for the airport, Usman is in great spirits. It looks like he's happy that Jamal is leaving. Bye, stepson. <laughs> As for Kim, well, at this stage, there's no sign that she's unhappy. There's no hint that their relationship is about to end. Maybe she was hiding all the issues while Jamal was there. Or maybe Usman was on his best behaviour until Jamal left. But whatever the truth is, when we join them the next morning in their hotel room, they're in the middle of a fight and everything has changed. Yeah, I'm sorry. The way I walk is wrong. The way I dress is wrong. It's like, why am I here? Seriously, you make me feel so incompetent. We're dropped slap bang in the middle of their argument. Now, there's no footage of what actually happened, but according to Kim, everything kicked off because Usman was nagging and disrespecting her. Usman started like nagging me about not cleaning up the room, like not putting his shoes away, and then talking about my weight. They're talking about how I'm gonna need a tummy tuck. This has understandably upset Kim, and it doesn't sound like a one-off issue. From what Kim says, it sounds like Usman is constantly nagging and belittling her. I would like respect. I don't think I'm asking for too much. I'm tired of feeling like I'm not enough. Why are you even with me? And I shouldn't have to feel that way. I have to do all this to conform to you. What the are you doing for me? In the heat of the moment, Kim also says something that I think is very revealing, but not altogether surprising. We all know they have communication issues, and there's always been clues that Usman doesn't find Kim as attractive as she finds him. So it's no real surprise to learn that behind the scenes, both their conversation and their sexual chemistry is dead. You can't even hold a conversation with me. We don't even have sex. Now, up until this point, it's interesting how Usman just sits there taking it all. He doesn't seem sure of what to do. But as soon as Kim mentions this next thing, oh boy, this is when he jumps up and starts yelling. This is an old argument that they haven't been able to resolve that's about to fester again. To sacrifice all I'm sacrificing. You cannot come here and start telling me all that. First of I'm all, first of all, let me tell you something. I can say whatever the f I want to say because I'm a grown ass woman. She thinks she do a lot. I think I do a lot. She thinks I, she sacrifices a lot. I think I sacrifice the most. This is an argument these two will never get to the bottom of. And to be honest with you, it's a stupid argument in the first place. Yet here we are and it's about to spill out of control. Kim tries to explain that for her, adopting Mahadi would be a huge sacrifice, but Usman doesn't accept that. His response? You're not adopting. I'm actually adopting. It's a huge sacrifice for me too. To do adopt? Just you, yes. Don't do it then. It's, no, you're not. No, 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 don't do it then. Oh my God. I do have to alter my life. It is a lot of thinking for me. I don't think he sees that. And then he pulls out the old classic. We've heard this one once or twice before, haven't we? Kim, you should be thankful I'm with you. I'm the one sacrificing the most. I'm giving up a second wife and my own child because of you. Basically, I'm doing you a favor. You always feel like you do things. Kimbali, me being with you is something that nobody, oh God, I cannot do nobody would do in my I region. Cannot. Usman is an expert at trying to make it seem like the fact that Kim can't have kids is this big problem that he's had to find solutions to. But in reality, he knew Kim couldn't have kids going into the relationship. 
if it was such a big issue, then it's an issue of his own making. He should never have got in a relationship with her. And for once, Kim isn't willing to back down. Every time I say something, it's like tip for tat. Oh, will you do this? Well, I sacrifice this for you. Oh, will you do well, I'm doing a favor by being with you. I don't want to be no man's favor. It can't just be his way all the time. It can't. And it's always been this way. Always. And I just had my fill today. I don't understand why I'm here. I really don't. If you don't understand why you're here, then you can pack your things and go back. Her emotions are clearly running very high at this point. Kim hates hearing that threat. She stands up, swears at Usman. You are a ass. Storms off to the bathroom, and a few seconds later, she comes back again, throws her engagement ring on the table, and tells Usman, that's it, it's over. I'm done here. And after storming out, Kim admits that the potential adoption has caused her to realise she and Usman have communication issues. It's sad that it's taken this long and a potential adoption to make her realise this, but it's better late than never. Maybe she was listening to Jamal after all. Usman and I can't talk about the adoption stuff for like an adult. Like how are you going to raise a child? We just cannot, we can't do it. I'm just done. I'm just done. This just might be it, because he's not hearing me. This is all very painful for Kim, and it's having an impact on Usman too. The fact that Kim is questioning him and not being 100% subservient to him is a concern. He doesn't like it. He tells us he just wants someone who will give him peace. In other words, who will just do everything he asks for. I am done. Things that I care about is that who is that person that can give me peace, and I think we'll never have peace, me and Kimbali. Both of them are now saying they're done. It even sounds like Kim is giving up claim to her man. Let one of these bitches in his DMs get him. That's the same complaint that his ex baby girl Lisa used to make. As the old saying goes, there's no smoke without fire. Why exactly is Usman talking to so many girls? Either way, when Kim goes back up to her hotel room, she tries to make amends. I don't want to end it with you. I don't want to not marry you. But I don't, I want to be heard in this relationship. Kim does her best to try and backtrack from her position. She's gone from, it's over, I'm done, take back your engagement ring, to, I don't want to end it with you, Osman, but please just listen to me. It's a drastic shift in position. And it's striking that, yet again, it's her trying to make the peace. But, sadly for Kim, Usman has made up his mind. And he is not going to backtrack. And I think the decision you make, Kimbali, is the best. This is the ring. You remove it, you keep it here, and you say you are done. So I think it is high time I just go back home. It's time for me to leave, he says. Let's stick to your original plan. You go your way, I'll go mine. I will go and find another partner, someone from my region, someone my family will support. Somebody who is around my culture, my, you know, like everything is the same. And I'll pray for you that you can find someone who's as good as or better than me. And then I, I pray for you, you should get the best, a man that is going to be better and better and better than me. I'll pray, I'll help you with prayer for that. <laughs> what a gentleman. He's even willing to pray for you, Kim, because he can find any woman he wants, but you, <laughs> you need divine intervention. And with that, Kim accepts what he has to say. Okay. All right. And then storms off. As she sits outside the hotel, Usman walks past, looks at Kim, but doesn't say a word, and then drives off. I cannot continue this way. I cannot be in a relationship that is so toxic and it look unhealthy to me. Now, I noticed that Usman didn't carry any luggage with him, just a pair of shoes. Maybe that indicates he is planning to come back to at least pick up his suitcase. But, as suspected, when Kim tells us that she's messaged him, Usman's response indicates he really does believe he is the best she will ever get. And then he said, you will never get the respect I give you by any man, but since you broke up with me, you'll find out soon. Thank you. As painful as this clearly is for Kim, she seems to have learned a very valuable lesson. She needs to stand up for herself. She needs to respect herself more. And she can't ever allow a man, or anyone for that matter, to belittle her and treat her like they're doing her a favor. I can't just sit here and just like 
let some dude just sit there and just like tear me down. And that's how it feels to me. <laughs> <laughs> Poor Kim, I find it really difficult to watch anyone in such pain, but you've got to say that this separation is for the best. The question is, however, is it really over or will they find themselves back together again? 